Hello and welcome back. So last time we read, we finished the chapter called Saved by a Whisker. And at the end, you know that Praiseworthy was, was cutting that miner's hair and they were able to take the hair clippings and put them in a pan and wash it with water and to the bottom of the pan fell um, gold dust because um, he was working out in the gold fields. So when you work out in the gold fields, you dig in dirt and mud and along the river. And so he was covered in mud, but within the mud were tiny um, gold pieces. So when they washed out the hair, all of the gold, which is heavy, went to the bottom of the pan, which means that they get to collect that gold and sell it and make some money, which is great because they need to get their fare for Sacramento City. And then they put up a sign that said, free haircuts, minors only. And some of you are like, well, why would it be minors only? Well, why do you think? What's gonna happen when they cut the hair of a minor? They're going to be getting the gold dust from the hair that they cut off. And other people wouldn't have gold stuck in their hair, so they're not gonna bother cutting their hair for free. So, pretty great. All right, the next chapter is called The Man in the Hippie Hoppa Hat. It was about a week before Praiseworthy and Jack reached the diggings. So they left Sacramento, they had to go up the Sacramento River, then they had to get on the stagecoach and then go into the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas. They had caught the four o'clock riverboat at the end of the Long Wharf. Dr. Buckby came to see them off, but he was staying behind in San Francisco. I'm going to wait for Cut-Eye Higgins, he said. He's bound to turn up with my map. I'll meet every ship that comes in until, my, until I get my hands on that scoundrel. That night, in their stateroom, Jack polished his horn spoon. Praiseworthy had let, him buy it, had let him buy it on the wharf with a pinch of gold dust. Finally, Jack tucked it inside his belt and looked at himself in the mirror. All he lacked was a red flannel shirt and a floppy hat. A beard was out of the question, at least for the time being. He glanced at Praiseworthy. He wondered what his partner would look like with his whiskers grown out and a revolver in his belt. Praiseworthy was as tall as Quartz Jackson and as straight as a post. There were even some sun creases forming in the corners of his eyes. Yes, sir, Jack thought. Praiseworthy would make a fine looking gent. Their adventure in barbering had paid expenses nicely. There was gold dust left over and Praiseworthy had poured it into the little finger of his left white glove hmm. for safekeeping. He made a list of the gold camps the miners had banded about, had bandied about, and now he studied the names. So I want to repeat that one more time about the gold dust. So he has gold dust and he, you know, obviously he's wearing his white gloves as always, and he doesn't have any place to sort of keep the gold dust. So he's poured it into the glove, into the finger of his glove, and then he's put the gloves on so no one will see the gold dust, but it will be there collecting at the bottom of his little finger there. And that's where he's sort of hiding their extra gold dust. All right. Um, so he's studying the names of future gold rush towns. Let's see, there's Chili Gulch, Grizzly Flats, Timbuktu, he muttered. They sound like dreadful places to take a growing boy. They sounded glorious to Jack. Don't worry about me, praiseworthy. I'm thinking of your Aunt Arabella. What would she think if you were to write from a place like Bedbug or Whiskey Flat or... Hangtown, Angel's Camp. She might approve of that, but they say it's a fearful place. Let me see. There's Rough and Ready, mm, there's You Bet, and there's Humbug. Not to mention Rawhide, Roaring Camp, and Cutthroat. Well, what'll it be, Master Jack? One place sounds as bloodthirsty as the next. Hangtown, said Jack then hang town it is. The following morning, Jack saw Indians for the first time in his life. They came to the banks of the river to watch the crowded boat and listen to the ringing of the pilot house bell. 
Jack stared back in fascination. Wouldn't his sisters Constance and Sarah be frightened? But that night, when the flat bottom riverboat got stuck on a sandbar, Jack felt a little uneasy himself. What if they came aboard when they were asleep? Oh, stuff and nonsense, praiseworthy smiled, shaving himself at the cabin mirror. The steward tells me they're very nice. They dig for roots and acorns, and all they bother are wa wasps and grasshoppers, which they consider a delicacy. With one sandbar and another, it was two days before Sacramento City came into view. A shore cannon went off, raising a cloud of dust to announce the arrival of the boat. Townspeople flocked to the river. Praiseworthy and Jack carried their picks and shovels, gold pans and carpet bags, through the crowd. Sorry. It was the end of June and the valley shimmered with heat. Wooden awnings stretched over the storefronts like eyelashes. As they walked along, Jack kept gazing at the mountains, the great Sierra Nevadas. They stood dark blue and purple against the hot morning sky. That must be where the gold is, Jack thought and fresh hope shot through him. They were almost there, weren't they? A stage was leaving for the mines at two o'clock. To raise their fare, the butler and the boy had no choice but to sell off a pick and a shovel. Mining tools were in great demand and the prices were astonishing. The pick and shovel brought $100 each. Holy cow. After paying their stage fare, Praiseworthy poured the gold dust left over into the tips of all five fingers of his left glove. He had difficulty getting his hand in, but he made it. His left hand felt as heavy as a rock. The dust was their grub stake, and that just simply means like their assurance that life will be okay and they'll be able to pay for stuff like food. Um, and he had no intention of losing it to some rascal along the way. We ought to carry a gun, praiseworthy, a four-shooter. There's no time for that, Master Jack. They were the last passengers to board the stagecoach. They had hardly taken their seats when the driver, a man with old buckskins, snapped his whip. The horses bolted, and they were off to the diggings. Jack was squeezed in beside Praiseworthy and a red-faced man wearing a string tie. He was quick to introduce himself as an undertaker. Anyone know what an undertaker is? Yep, it's a person who buries dead bodies. He was quick to introduce himself. Fletcher's the name, gentleman, Jonas T. Fletcher of Hangtown. I don't mind telling you that business is brisk in my line of work up there in the diggings. Glad to meet you, yes, sir, socially or professionally, as the case may be. In the seat opposite sat two Frenchmen in brand new jack boots and checkered shirts with creases still in them. Between them and opposite Jack, so that their knees almost touched, sat a man in a dusty linen suit and his hat pulled down over his face. He had been sleeping that way from the moment Praiseworthy and Jack had entered the coach. Don't see how a man can sleep on this road, Jonas T. Fletcher laughed. Maybe he's dead. Ain't that a fine looking hippie hop a hat he's got? Must have bought that in Panama. I came across the plains myself, clear from Missouri in a wagon. Jonas T. Fletcher droned on. The team of horses raised red clouds of dust and Jack watched the passing sights as best he could. They overtook ox-drawn wagons loaded with stores for the mines and strings of pack mules. The man in the fine straw hippie hop a hat slept on. A large ruby ring glistened from his finger. With the jostling of the stage, his coat fell open and Jack could see the butt of a dueling pistol tucked inside his belt. It was almost an hour before he awoke. His hand rested on the pistol. 
and he tipped the hat back off his face. He looked straight into Jack's eyes with the faintest of smiles, as if he hadn't been asleep at all. Jack very nearly jumped. It was Mr. Cut Eye Higgins. The end. See you next time.